this is a pie. And this is a hole. You put them together and you get, well, a pie in a hole. Which brings me to the topic of this video, pie hole. You may be asking yourself right now, what exactly is pie hole and why do you care? Well, pie hole is a Linux-based network-level advertisement filter that acts as a DNS sinkhole that you can put on your network in order to filter out unwanted advertisement. Or as I like to describe it, the internet condom. Whether you're protecting yourself on public Wi-Fi, bypassing regional filters, or just simply wanting to download something without the worries of a government or a corporation not liking you for it, a VPN service is a must-have solution. And depending on where you're located, it could be hard to find a VPN fast enough for daily use. That's why the 30-day 100% money-back guarantee of NordVPN is so valuable. Because even though I can tell you I get great speeds and reliability, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. By visiting nordvpn.com slash byte or clicking the link in the video description below, you can test these speeds out for yourself with a heavy discount. And with 30 days to prove it's worth, it's a safe way to ensure you're getting what you paid for. Now, due to the potential new war that Google Chrome is going to wage against ad blockers, I decided to find out two things about Piehole. One, how easy is it to get set up? And two, what's the difference between the regular internet and Piehole's filtered version of the internet? Now, obviously, testing out the entirety of the internet is an impossible task, but still, I wanted to go to a few places and at least kind of see the difference. But before I get to the testing, let me cover some of the basics in getting it up and running. First off, for this video, you will need a Raspberry Pi, or technically, anything that runs Linux. And then, if you want to follow along, you'll need to download the latest version of Raspbian. Of course, links for all of this will be in the description down below. So download the Raspbian stretch with desktop and recommended software, and then download the software called Etcher. Now, Etcher will actually burn this image to a micro SD card. And yes, you need one of those too. Load up the Etcher software, find the location of which you saved the image file, make sure to select the correct location for the micro SD card in your computer, and click Flash. Now, this might take anywhere from four to seven minutes to complete, depending on your micro SD card, but just let it do its thing. When it's done, take the micro SD card and shove it right up the butt of your Pi. And after you give it a little bit of time, it will boot up directly to a desktop. From the top left of the desktop, launch a new terminal window and type in exactly what you see on the screen. A little side note, you might need to change your keyboard layout. I ran into this problem when I was typing in characters and it was not matching. For some reason, my keyboard defaulted to the UK. I changed it to US. After that was said and done, I finished typing it out. I press enter and just let it do its thing. You will have to press space to get through a few screens, but one thing to note here while it's getting set up is that it will ask for a static IP. By default, it will automatically assign the IP that it already has. So moving forward, not shown in this video, I recommend two things. One, change your network settings on your Pi to always use the same IP address. And or two, on a router level, set a static IP address for the MAC address of your Pi. If you'd like a little bit more of a detailed tutorial on how to install Raspbian along with Pi Hole, I will link to a video down below in the description. I want to keep this video more of a how easy was it kind of a thing and not focus so much on the tutorial. With that said, installing Raspbian was simple. It's a matter of burning that image and then installing the Pi Hole application itself was just a matter of one command line. Yes, I do have to space through a few different things, but overall it was a very simple process. In fact, according to my recordings, I wasn't even in a hurry. It took less than 20 minutes from start to finish, including downloading and flashing the image files. But that brings me to after I get Piehole set up. The first thing I wanted to do was obviously go into the web management portal and, and basically just kind of check things out. To do this, all I had to do was navigate to the IP address that was assigned to it on my local intranet, and then it automatically popped up a welcoming screen that I could, on the left-hand side, click log into in order to get more details. From here, I get what looks to be a potential wealth of information if I were to have already been testing this out, but since I haven't connected a client to it yet, it's kind of blank. But you can still see that there are a number of clients connected, how many queries were blocked, etc. So after poking around the interface a little bit, I decided to connect my main computer to Piehole. And in order to do that, all I had to do was go into my networking properties, configure my IPv4 settings, and change my DNS server to the local Piehole intranet IP address. Just keep in mind that I am making this change on a single computer level. But with Piehole, you can direct your own router to point to Piehole before it connects to the rest of the internet. So if I wanted to go into PFSense, I could tell PFSense to use this Piehole as a DNS server. And if I did that, any request off of my local computer network would automatically be routed through that DNS server. 
So after I get everything configured, I can go back to that main screen and it now shows two clients connected, one being the Raspberry Pi and the other being my main computer. Now first I was going to use Chrome in order to test a few different websites out, but honestly uBlock Origin was a little annoying and I kept disabling it for each individual website. I ended up just saying I might as well use Edge because it doesn't have any extensions installed into it, no built-in ad blocking or anything like that, so it was kind of a good testing ground for me. And this is where I kind of had to just make stuff up as I went along because I didn't really know what websites I wanted to feature, but I tried to assume which websites might have the most ads on them and or be common websites for people to visit. So without any pre-planning, I just typed in websites that just popped in my head. So the first website I ended up testing with Piehole was CNN.com. After that, I loaded up Fox.com. Then I went to YouTube.com, decided why not go to TheVerge.com, ABCNews.com, and then afterwards, I decided to do a quick speed test. No real reason to it. After all, a DNS server just connects you to other computers. It doesn't actually control the flow of that data. I just wanted to do it either way. So now that I have a couple of my test websites loaded up, I go back into my DNS server settings, and I change them to the Google DNS server IP addresses. One quick note before I show some of the differences in these websites, since I am doing a split screen, the websites are slightly more compressed than what they normally would be, but just so I could make this video and compare them directly side by side, they are kind of scrunched up a little bit. But either way, any well-known website should have the ability to adapt to whatever size is necessary. So first up, I loaded the rawcnn.com right next to the original cnn.com that I loaded that didn't have any ads. And the only thing I really saw was a large banner at the top. Now, although I'm not a big fan of how big the banner is, it's actually not too bad. You see, when I think about browsing the internet without any kind of ad blocker, I think of just all these news sites that put ads anywhere they possibly can. I mean, I just have a very bad view of how they like to exploit all of the ads they possibly can for the people who don't run ad blocker. So when I saw this, I was actually kind of surprised. The next up we have Fox.com, which actually ended up looking exactly the same for me. And then I decided to load YouTube. Now with YouTube on the right hand side, you can still see it has that huge header allocated for the ad space, but it can't actually load the ads. And this is actually something that stands out to me because with something like uBlock Origin, it will actually take out that CSS and it won't take up that space and give you an error message it will just automatically adjust the website to fit around where the ads were supposed to be, which in my opinion gives me a much more enjoyable browsing experience. Then I jump over to The Verge, which is similar to CNN.com that has the very large banner at the top, which again, I really just don't like. I mean, if you look at The Verge and all the boxes and the way they have their website designed, they could have integrated these ads a lot better into the actual design of the website rather than feeling like they just plugged them in last minute like it does here. But either way, moving on, the next one is abcnews.com, which it doesn't really look any different to me either. Another website that popped into my head was IFL Science, uh, which stands for I freaking love science, unless you're an adult, and then the F means something else. But I wanted to see what that looked like, ads versus no ads, and this banner is not as big, but it's kind of placed the same way. Just seems like it's an afterthought. It's really not that bad. So after I got an idea of what some of these websites look like, I was kind of curious if somebody were to run Piehole on their local intranet and still want to use something like Chrome, even if Adblock was disabled, what if they want to go to YouTube? Will they have to sit through the different ads that YouTube has before videos, or will it block everything out that uBlock Origin does? This is something that's kind of mixed feelings for me because on one end, I do want to support the creators I watch and I do want people to support what I do by watching ads before my video. But on the other end, I absolutely hate ads. So I decided to go into a couple different videos and it doesn't actually seem to be able to block the YouTube pre-roll video ads. Of course, I am just using the initial installation of Piehole. I didn't add any custom rules or any custom servers for ad blocking. So in short, I didn't go down the rabbit hole of Piehole, as it were, and find different ways to block ads on different websites like YouTube. So it is very possible that if I did dive deeper into this, I could block a lot more ads than it does block just stock. But using the basic generic installation instructions, I still watch pre-roll ads and I still have ads pop up on at least some of the screens. Sometimes it blocks them, sometimes it don't, but it displays ads more often than not. So after I was all said and done with that, I decided to go back to the Piehole web interface and take a look at some of the new statistics that I got. So as you can see, just with my limited testing, I got a lot of queries to the DNS servers and a lot of blocks. In fact, 46.1% of all queries sent to the DNS server Piehole was blocked, which is crazy to let that sink in. Almost half of all internet queries are for advertisement. 
almost half. So Pi-hole is easy to set up, it was easy to use and configure. I set it up just for my computer to access it, but I could also easily set it up for my router to access it as the main DNS server. But I quickly found out that Pi-hole has more to offer, including logging the queries coming from your local intranet. It shows which ones were blocked, which ones were allowed. It allows me to go through and blacklist specific servers. So if I were to go through and find a domain name that keeps popping up that is obvious an ad server that for some reason is not blacklisted, I could manually blacklist it here. On the flip side of that, if you try to load a website and something's not working and you need to whitelist something, you could do that as well. So if by any chance the developers over at Chrome decide they are going to wage an all-out war against ad blockers and you are heavily dedicated to the continual use of Chrome, then you might want to consider running something like Pi-hole to at least give you a little bit of protection while browsing the internet. I do feel like Pi-hole is definitely a rabbit hole of sorts where if I wanted to, I could go through and add so many different servers and really build up a list of block domains that will sanitize the internet further and make the overall browsing experience a lot better. But it was kind of interesting to go through and refresh websites and look at how many queries were blocked every time I refreshed it. Doing so actually pushed my percentage of blocked over 55% at one point. Again, I know this is not an accurate representation of what the entirety of the internet looks like. It's only just a handful of websites that I wanted to compare side by side to see what the difference in browsing would be from no ad blocking to pie hole DNS ad blocking. Also, I have a Raspberry Pi that I just wanted to do something with, so, you know. This is interesting to me. Well, guys, if you liked this video, I appreciate it if you pass me a like. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, post them in the comments down below. As always, thank you for watching, and you have yourself a good day.